Hello everyone and welcome back to session three of Warwick Data Science Society's Into the Tidyverse course. So a warning about the session, it will be a bit more dense and fast paced than the usual ones. And that's because we're looking at data manipulation. So taking a data set and trying to answer questions about it. And unsurprisingly, there are many different ways you can answer questions about your data. And so to get through all those in one session, we are going to be being quite brief, just kind of having a very general overview of all the different techniques. And you can spend the time uh, while doing the homework to actually learn these in some, some more detail and actually apply them. Let's start with a quick recap of the stuff we looked at in last session. So the main body of last session was about importing data. One useful topic we talked about in, a, in the process of learning that was about vectors. So vectors are central to the language R. It's known as a, a vectorized or a functional language. That means that kind of the smallest unit of, um, I guess, of data storage is this thing called a vector. So we create a vector in R by using this C function, which is short for combine. We combine these numbers together into a vector. For example, here we create a vector x by combining the numbers 1, 4, and 9 together. So here we have a vector with three elements, 1, 4, and 9. And another way we saw creating this was using um, the seq function allows you to create a, um, a sequence either increasing by a certain number or with a certain target length. And so the important thing is that R um, and its mathematical operations are vectorized. So that means if you have a vector like 149 and you take the square root of it, what R is going to do is, is it's going to calculate the square root of every individual element. And in a similar way, if we add two vectors together, we're going to um, add the elements element-wise. And um, yeah, I think I suggested last time, maybe have a play around with um, adding vectors, um, doing operations with vectors of different lengths to see what, what happens. Because even R will be flexible enough to try and allow that to go through. But you can you know, play around for yourself to see what exact behavior happens. Okay, so then the main body is all about reading CSVs. And we use the read underscore CSV function to do this and learned about various parameters. Um, but the most important parameter was um, the first one we passed in was the path to the data we wanted to import. And so a slightly confusing concept was that this was a relative path. So uh, we give it relative to a place called our current working directory, basically where we're currently located. Change that by using um, one of the options in the session menu in the top bar. But there's also the function set WD, which will set your working directory. So yeah, session set working directory is the um, easy way to do that. And then from that working directory, we can then specify path to our data and import that. We saw various different parameters for controlling how that importing took place, um, but I'm not going to get into that now. You can have a look at last session if you want to recap. And then we closed off by having a quick look at line plots. So using geom underscore line and geom underscore smooth, creating either straight line or smooth line plots. And these had two aesthetics we hadn't seen before, were line type and group. And also for um, GM Smooth, we had the properties SE, which we could set to false um, to get rid of these standard error bars, these kind of um, shaded areas around the line to show uncertainty. And we saw in the homework that we can choose between different types of smoothing methods by using method equals and then one of these going from LN for um, a linear model, very simple model, to um, a generalized add additive model, um, which is a more complicated model. Okay, so the main topic today is all about um, manipulating data. But before we get into that, we need to go through a few, a few more basics, just to try and um, build up um, our familiarity with how R computes statistics. Okay, so yeah, there's many features, uh, kind of basic features of the R language that we've skipped over to get to the more exciting stuff worth going back to this, it's important to understand before getting into manipulating data. That's the focus of now. Okay, so as I mentioned in the first session, R is a language that was originally intended for statistics. And so um, it's got a very wide scope of abilities in what it can do statistically. We haven't really touched on that yet. And so what a statistic is, a very simple definition, is it's a function of data points. If I have a load of data points, I could calculate the mean, the median, the maximum of that data, and that is known as a statistic. Just some function 
of what data we have available. So we can largely group these different statistics into a few categories. One is um, measures of location, basically statistics that say something about where your data is centered. Um, or kind of, yeah, kind of, yeah, the, the location of where your data is on a number line. For example, we can take a vector here with the numbers 4, 10, 10, 12, and 19. Um, and then we can use the mean function to calculate the mean of this vector. And so if the mean is the, um, you know, the average value, as it would be called colloquially. Um, yeah, we add all the values up, then divide by how many there are. That's, that's the mean. If you add these up, we get 55, divide by how many there are, 5 and we get a mean of 11. Similarly, we have the median. This is what happens if we order all of our points um, in order and then take the middle one. And so these already are in order. We can see the middle one is 10. So the mean is a good metric to use if you care about the outliers because those will um, weigh the mean, whereas the median doesn't care about out outliers. <coughs> Sorry. You can um, change this 19 here to be 105 and the median will stay exactly the same whereas the mean um, will change. Another um, useful statistic is, um, or kind of group statistics are the quantiles. These are um, the markers dividing your data into quarters. They get similar to the median, but at 25% um, marks. And so when we use the quantile function, rather than getting a single value, we get a vector of five values. Actually, this is a named vector where, um, these are the actual values, and then these are the names for each value. These give kind of the 0, 25, 50, 75, and 100 um, percentiles of the data. If we want a specific one of those, we would then use square brackets that we use for indexing a vector. So take out the um, second one here, which is the 25th percent one, by using um, the number 2. And here we see that uh, we get 10. Okay, so those are measures of location. Now we have measures of spread, which talk about how spread out our data is, what sort of variability we have in our data. Take the same vector that we had before. And the first thing we might want to do is calculate the range of our data. So in um, scientific terms, the range of our data is uh, the difference between the largest and the smallest element. But R treats this a bit differently. And rather than giving us that single number, it gives us the biggest and the smallest. So use range of X and we get or 19, the biggest and smallest numbers. As if this, this is just a vector of two elements. If we want the actual scientific range, so the difference between the largest and smallest element, we can use the diff function. So for difference, uh, we put the output of range x inside of there. Then we'll calculate the difference um, between these two values here, giving us 15. And um, sometimes we might want to um, calculate kind of a pseudo range, but ignoring the outlying values. And to do that, we can use the interquartile range. This is actually the difference between um, the 25th and 75th percentile we saw here. So the number two. And so to calculate this, you use the function IQR for interquartile range, whereas range return two values, IQR returns the single one, which is that interquartile range. You don't need to use diff for the second one. And so, for more measures of spread, we have um, the var function for calculating the variance of data. So the variance, what happens when you um, find the difference between each value and the mean of the data, and then square those values and add them all up. That's the variance. So here we um, have, sorry, and then you then divide by how many there are. So it's the average squared difference from the mean. And so here this happens to be 29. And that definition might seem a bit complicated if you don't have a statistical background. Essentially, it's a measure of how spread out your data is. And then we might also want the standard deviation. We can calculate that with the SD function. And um, this is equivalent to the square root of whatever this variance is. So square root of 29 is 5 point something. And this is um, a much more useful measure because um, let's say if our X was in the units of meters, so this was 4 meters, 10 meters, etc. then the unit of variance is a meter squared. So it's not really comparable, whereas the standard deviation has the unit of meters as well. This is kind of saying the typical amount that your data deviates by. Okay, so those are um, very useful statistics. Um, but as we mentioned last time, rare in real-world context to always have your whole data set available. 
You might have missing values or unknown values. Uh, how are these statistical functions going to deal with that? And so the general rule is that if there's ever a missing value um, in the input to a statistical transformation, then the results will always be missing as well. So it's going to be NA. And the reason for this makes sense, that if I want to calculate the mean of some data that has a missing value, an NA value, I don't know what the, um, the result is. Uh, if that NA had been really big, it's going to skew the mean upwards. If it was small, it would skew the mean downwards. So I have no idea what the mean is. And so if I have a vector x here, which has an NA value, and calculate the mean of that, well, then I'm going to get NA. Sometimes we'll want to overwrite this behavior if we know that the NAs um, can be, be ignored. Um, and in that case, we can uh, add a second argument, separate by a comma, and then use na.rm, so for na.remove, uh, and set that equal to true, saying remove the na values and then calculate the mean. And so in this case, we'll calculate the mean using just these four values. Add up four non-missing values and divide by four. It's like that any value just completely did disappear, a pre-processing step before calculating the mean. Um, but otherwise, if we don't use this, then for any of these statistics, we'll always get NA as the output. Okay, and so um, another useful thing to look at is um, how we can compare two values. So if I'm given two numbers, say, how can I check if one is bigger than the other? Are they equal? Various things like that. And then going even further, if I make one comparison and a second one, how could I combine those together? Say I demand that both these comparisons have to be true, or um, at least one of them is. And um, that's what this section is going to be about, making those comparisons and using these things called Boolean operators to um, combine these together. And so we're going to start with some very basic ordering comparisons. Uh, these allow us to compare two numbers and see which is bigger or smaller than the other. So we have the um, less than symbol. And so this is going to ask, uh, is 4 less than 6? And this is going to return either the value true or false. And it's true in all caps here. Because like we saw with this um, na.remove, R has these values true and false in all caps. And there's a special constants in the language that represent um, something being true or something being false. And so here, this is a true statement. 4 is less than 6. And so we get true returned. Um, 3 less than or equal to 3. Um, that is a true statement. 3 is equal to 3, so this you know, holds vacuously. We have true again. Is 5 less than 4? That's not the case, so we get false here. And we also see here greater than or equal to. So we have less than, greater than, and these um, less than, greater than, or equal to. And so the only complicated thing about this is remembering um, what order to put these two symbols when you have um, greater than, less than, or equal to. And the way that I remember it is um, it's the order you say it in. So if I say less than or equal to, um, I said less than first and then equal to. So that's the order that I write them in. So I get three is less than or equal to three. And so we also have um, ways of checking for equality. Uh, and so I mentioned this or I hinted at it in the first session that um, even though R uses this, um, this left arrow symbol for assigning objects um, or assigning values to, um, to objects, you can also use the equals from other languages. And for that reason, um, that equal symbol is reserved for that other purpose. If we want to check for equality in a mathematical sense, we have to use this double equal symbol. So here we ask, is 4 equal to, double equals here, number 4? And we get true. They are equal. 4 equal to 5, false. And we also have um, exclamation mark equals for not equal. So it's 4, not equal to 4. A false statement because they are in fact equal. Or not equal to five is um, a true statement because they're not equal. Uh, and I'm just going to show you briefly what happens if we try to um, actually make this a bit bigger first. If I try to do something like two equals to two, um, I'm going to get get an error uh, because what we meant there was two double equals um, to two. And what we're writing with the first one is basically this: assign the value two to two. And the error we're getting is saying that left-hand side, so the number two, does not support assignment, um, which makes sense. Like we shouldn't be allowed to change the value of the symbol two. It should always represent the numeric value two. So R won't let us do that. 
but just be aware you can get errors that seem a bit unintuitive. Um, my general advice would be whenever you're using or trying to check a quality, if an error comes up, the first thing to check is that you meant um, whether you should have put double equals rather than single. Okay, and so it should come as no, no surprise with R being a vectorized language that comparisons are also vectorized. If I take two vectors and um, compare them, then what's going to happen is that each comparison is going to take place element wise and give a vector, um, a Boolean or logical vector of trues and falses as the result. For example, we have um, x is 2, 6, 10, y is 3, 5, 10, and we ask is x less than or equal to y? And so the first comparison is 2 less than or equal to 3, true. 6 less than or equal to 5, that's false. 10 less than or equal to 10, that's true. And so we get this vector here, the same length as the two inputs. We do the same for equality here. And so we can also then transform a logical vector into a single logical value using the functions all and any. Um, you can have a look at the corresponding help pages um, to just question mark all or question mark any to learn some more about that. The general idea is that um, you can take a logical vector and um, then we'll put it into all. This will return true only if everything or all of the values are true and any will do the same if any of them are true. Look at the help pages for more details and examples. Okay, so that was comparisons. What if we want to then combine comparisons together into more complicated, uh, what are known as Boolean expressions, so logical expressions? And I should just mention now, I'm going to use the word Boolean a fair bit, and that's named after a mathematician, George Boole, who kind of invented um, this topic. But Boolean essentially just means logical, so true or false. And so, um, we can combine these together using a variety of operators. So we've seen operators before, the plus symbol, the time symbol, those are operators that act on numbers. Um, Boolean operators are operators that act on true and false values. For example, we have the AND operator. And the symbol for this is the ampersand. So on my keyboard, it's shift and seven. Might be different for you. And this will take two logical values and return true only if both inputs are true. So if the first one is true, and the second one is true. The true and true gives us true. True and false or false and true, it's symmetric, will give us false. We need them both to be true. And false and false, again, neither of them are, are, are true. Um, and so we get false. Similar to this, we have or. And the symbol for this is a vertical bar. Uh, on my keyboard, um, I'm not even sure where that is. Oh, it's in, in the bottom left for me. But again, you might have to have to search for that a bit. And this is going to return true if one or both of its inputs are true. Again, if we have true or true, we get a true. Um, if, we, if we have true or false or false or true, um, then we get true because at least one of them is true. Only when we have false as both inputs do we get false. So this might seem a bit confusing because it differs um, to how we normally use the word or in everyday speech. If a parent went to their child, you can have ice cream or chocolate, and then um, the child came back with eating both of those, the parent would be annoyed. They meant one or the other. In language, we often mean that. Um, but in programming, for some, um, some reasons we're not going to get into, it ends up being quite elegant when you get more in-depth uh, in programming. Um, it makes more sense to have or being one or the other um, or both of them. So that's the definition we use. Just be aware of that. And so we also have one more Boolean operator, um, which is the not operator. And this one is slightly different because rather than behaving on two Boolean values, it behaves on a single one. And all it does is it negates that value. So it turns true into false and false into true. Uh, so we do, the symbol for this is an exclamation mark. We put it before a Boolean value. It's going to turn true into false and false into true. And so, these might seem quite um, abstract, um, but they make a lot more sense when you combine them with um, comparisons. So for example, I could have the comparison four bigger than three and two is equal to one. This makes more, more sense now. We're asking, is it the case that four is bigger than three and two is equal to one? Which is a false statement because only one of those is true. The important thing I want to get across is that even though we can now think abstractly at the level of these comparisons as like an English sentence of four bigger than three and two equal to one, 
And what's happening under the hood is R sees this comparison, turns it into a Boolean value, and then the actual Boolean operator of AND behaves at this level, on the logical level. So um, you just be aware of that. that you are free to kind of abstract it away into kind of um, talking about it using English language. In a similar way, we can ask, is 7 not equal to 5, or is 4 less than 2? Actually, at this first point, I already know the whole thing is true. Because an OR only requires one of its inputs, or both of them, to be true. And the first one is true, so the whole thing is true. Maybe we can go further, combining together nots and ands, and various things like that. So, I've thrown in a lot of brackets here. And actually, the majority of them, I think apart from one of them, um, aren't actually needed. But when you're still learning R, it's best practice to throw in um, more brackets than necessary just to avoid any mistakes and to avoid ambiguity when sharing with people who maybe also aren't as experienced. So R does have a very strict order, it's a very consistent order um, for what um, yeah, order things get evaluated in. And so you can omit brackets if you know what that order is. You can find that by using question mark and syntax. If you're still learning or you don't want to confuse people, it's best to um, put in more brackets than necessary. Nothing bad can happen from doing that. Okay, and again, unsurprisingly, Boolean operators can act on vectors. Here I define three vectors, x, y, and z. I do these all on one line using a semicolon to separate the inputs. This is very bad practice. You, sh you should not do it, but keep everything on one slide. That's what I did. Um, but in practice, you should never do this. <laughs> Sorry for sharing bad habits. Um, and then we can ask, is x equal to y? That this vector here is y less than z vector. And then we can take those two uh, Boolean vectors and combine those together using, um, say, an AND, for example. We're saying um, x is equal to y is this vector here, and y less than z is here. And we're doing the Boolean AND on those. So we're asking, are they both true? In the first one, we have false and false. Um, neither of those are true, so we get false. True and true, both are true, so we get true. False and true, well, only one of them is true. We need both of them, and so we get false. In a similar way, we can negate a um, Boolean vector at the bottom here. Okay, that's all of the kind of preliminaries for learning more about manipulating and transforming data. Um, so now let's get into looking at that. Okay, so we're going to return to this map of um, data science and data analytics just to kind of figure out where we are. So, so far we've been um, looking at visualization and having a look at importing data. And now we're um, in the middle of um, the data science workflow, this kind of really integral step, um, which is um, transforming your data. So uh, taking a data set and manipulating it to answer a question you might have about it. And so we're gonna use a package called dplyr to do this. And the D stands for data, and um, plier as in like the tools, pliers you would use for manipulating things. And this is just another package that's part of the tidyverse. And so there's five main features of this package. These are referred to as the dplyr verbs. Um, they're called verbs because they, they do something. And so these allow you to do a variety of things. Um, so filtering data sets, transforming it to get new views and summaries. Um, and they can also let you reorder your observations um, so they're easier to work with. We'll break those down uh, bit by bit. So, a very quick overview of what those five verbs are before we get into some examples. Um, so yeah, five verbs, and these alone will allow you to do pretty much everything you want to do um, with respect to data analysis. Um, so just five things to learn. It might seem like a lot to take in at first. Bear in mind that with these things, you can tackle 99% of problems. And so the five verbs are as follows. We have filter, which is for picking out certain observations of so certain rows of the data. Arrange, which is for reordering observations, so putting them uh, in a certain order based on what values that they have. Select is like filter, but for columns, so picking out certain columns, certain variables in your data. Uh, mutate is used for creating a new variable based on an existing one, perhaps um, converting its unit or combining variables together into a new one. And summarize allows you to collapse down multiple rows into a single value using a statistic. Why we were looking at those at the start. And so these five verbs can be used together with this thing called group by. And so group by is a very powerful um, function in dplyr. 
which controls the scope at which statistics or group operations behave. So for example, we might want to calculate um, the mean of a certain column. Uh, by default, that will take the mean of the whole column. Maybe we want to calculate a separate mean for different groups of the data. So for maybe um, for males and females. And group by will let us control at what scope these aggregations happen. We'll get more to that later. And so all the five verbs we saw on the last slide and group by have the same sort of um, behavior. So the first argument they take, the first input, is always the data frame we're, um, we're manipulating, or transforming. And we follow this by more arguments which control exactly how to run that, that command. Um, so if it was filtering, it would explain how we should be filtering. And whenever we use variable names inside of these dplyr verbs, we don't need to put them in quotes. We just use the variable names directly. Um, when I say variable names, I mean column names. And the result of these functions is always a new data frame after the transformation has, has taken place. Okay, so we're going to start by looking at how we can filter rows. And we do this using the filter function. This allows us to take a data frame and to um, pull out certain rows. I'm actually going to run through this, this example um, in the console. Let me make sure I've loaded up uh, the tidyverse. Yep. Let's have a reminder of what the MPG data set looks like. So something like this. We can see 234 rows there. Let's filter it. Um, first, we're going to filter it so that we only have cars that have a city mileage above 30. Okay. We're going to use the filter command from dplyr. Put in the data set as our first argument. And the city mileage has to be bigger than 30. Um, actually, let's do this in a different order. Let's do uh, the number of cylinders first. That will make more sense. Okay. So here we want the number of cars, uh, or sorry, all the cars that have four cylinders. You can see there are now 81 of these. This is the new data set that gets outputted below. And it's been restricted. So they all have four cylinders. This is using one filter. You see we use a double equals here. If I use a single equals, we're going to get a complaint. Um, actually, this error says, did you mean double equals? So dplyr is quite friendly. Um, and then we can add a second filtering. Um, rather than using city mileage, let's use something like, um, well, no, we use city, but we're going to say bigger than um, 20, say. So we're going to filter out, say, this, um, these uh, two Audis here, a few more below. So now we're left with 43 cars. So you could keep chaining more and more conditions, and all these ones separated by commas have to be satisfied at the same time. And so, yeah, key point, don't mistake double equals with a single equal. That's how we can use filter. Um, and so all the different inputs separated by commas, those all have to be true. If we want um, a case where either this is true or this is true, that's where our Boolean operators come in handy. We can use this, um, this or symbol, this, this vertical bar, to say I want the model to be Land Cruiser Wagon four-wheel drive, or the engine size, Dispel, is bigger than 6.8. So here we get um, a Corvette with engine size of 7, and the Land Cruiser, um, even though the engine size is less than 6.8. So this symbol means... We can use an exclamation mark as well for um, negating things or an and if we wanted, although you know, it does make more sense to just use comma separate inputs because that implies an and. So another useful um, feature or, or operator in the R language is its percentage in percentage. And this is used for checking if, um, if uh, a value, so a certain column, uh, is in a vector of values. So for example, um, we take this band members data set here, and that looks something uh, like this. And we could filter it so that, um, well, I guess, could, let, let's start with this. So we want to only have um, people in, in this uh, the band members data set where their name is John or Paul. So one way we could do this is setting name uh, equal to John using a, a horizontal, sorry, vertical bar for or. Uh, the name is Paul. And that's fine, but what if we wanted more of these? So, um, or name equals um, Ringo, or name equals, and we carried on like, like that. It's going to get really kind of lengthy, and we're repeating this name equals every time. 
The nice way of writing this is to use percentage in percentage and then specify vector. This asks, is the value of name um, in this vector? So we could put John and Paul in this vector. We could add maybe Mick as well. Um, and we run that. And then anywhere where the name is in this vector, we get that returned. That's a more elegant way of doing, um, doing that sort of thing rather than using multiple ors. Okay, so here's a very interesting way about, about how computers deal with decimal data. Uh, and so almost all programming languages store decimal values using a thing called floating point arithmetic. Um, we're not going to get into the de details of how this works, but basically the problem comes down to computers only have a finite amount of memory, and so they can only store these decimal numbers up to a certain number of, um, or a certain amount of precision. As this can lead to very peculiar behavior. For example, if I take the square root of 2 and square that, uh, which should be the number 2, and ask is that equal to 2, the answer is false. That's because the square root of 2 is an irrational number, can't be represented exactly, and so um, instead it uh, is given a value that's kind of a, a rounding, an approximation of the true value, and when we square that number, the approximation gets even worse, and by that point we're maybe 1.999 something, or 2.0000, you know, one whatever, and so we're not actually equal anymore, we get false. Another example would be doing 1 divided by 49 times by 49, it should be the number 1, and it's not, because 1 over 49 can't be represented perfectly in a computer, and so when we times it back up, that um, approximation error grows, it's no longer equal to 1. And so whenever we're handling values that are not integers, not whole numbers, um, we should use the near function rather than checking using for equivalence using um, this double equals here. And so near takes two inputs and asks, are they basically the same? Are they within a rounding error? And so two numbers have to be extremely close together for near to return true. It's within what's known as the um, machine epsilon, which is this absolutely tiny number. And so near is basically the same thing as equals, but it's tolerant to rounding errors. So is the square root of 2 squared near 2? Yeah, that's true. And um, same for the second one. That's how we can get around this problem. Okay. We'll also look at handling missing values. Um, so in many, in many cases, we're going to either want to um, remove missing values or to look at the rows where we have missing values to try and understand why they might be missing. And so to do this, we can use the is.na function. That's going to take a, um, a column or a vector and return true wherever um, its values are na. But let's just give you an example of this. If I have a vector x here, which is um, 3 uh, na 4 5, and I ask is.na of x, this returns a vector, false, true, false, false. I guess actually I haven't explicitly mentioned this, but um, when we're filtering, um, actually let's go back to this example. When we do something like this, it's city bigger than, than 30. What this returns is a, a Boolean vector. So a, vectors, uh, a vector of true and false is the length of our data set. And then what filter will do is only keep the rows where that value was true. We're keeping the true ones. So you can think of this just as filtering to where city mileage is bigger than 30. In reality, computes um, a logical vector and it filters based on that. And so when we use NA, we get a logical vector uh, like this here, and then we use that to filter on, keeping the true values. And so if I have a um, data frame here, so uh, let's just see what that looks like. That's some sort of code to make a data frame from scratch. Uh, we see we have the X column here with one and then missing value. I can filter the data frame to only have rows with a missing value by using filter on the data frame. And the filter I'm going to use is is.nax. So is um, column x is the value na. And we'll see we get only the na row here. We can use the exclamation mark to negate those Boolean values, those logical values. Um, and that's going to give us rows where it's not the case that x is na. So the other rows there. Okay, so that's all we have for filtering. 
Now I'm going to have a look at how we can um, arrange and sort rows in a certain order. Okay, so arrange is used to sort our observations, our rows, by more, uh, sorry, by one or more variable in ascending order. That's, that's the default behavior. And so the observations are ordered um, by the first column first, and then we would break any ties by using the second column. So here um, we use a range on the MPG, MPG date data set, um, and we start by arranging by the class. So one of the variables in the data set, um, let's actually do this um, over here. We'll start just by arranging by the class. We'll see here that we start with two seater. Um, numbers come first alphabetically, um, in R at least, followed by the compact cars here. So we ordered by the class in ascending order. Then we can add in, um, what is it, year next? We can see the years here. Um, actually, they happen to be in order already. Um, yeah, let's do this in the other order then. So um, we're going to order by the years first. Then we can see these classes are completely out of order. Let's order by the class next. And then um, we're ordering by the year first. So the main thing, then we break any ties where the years are the same by using the class. And then if there's still any ties, then um, we just keep things in the same order they originally were in the data set. We can add as many um, uh, columns to order by as we want, um, but eventually if we run out of those, then we'll just leave things as they were originally. Okay, we might want to order in um, descending order. And to do that, we wrap a certain column or variable with the DESC function or for descending. And so here we um, order the um, MPT data set first by class and then by the year in descending order. So class is still ascending and then the year is descending. So every descending column, you have to wrap it in D. Okay. And um, what's going to happen with missing values? So we have a data set here, single column X with the values 1, N, A, and 5. Let's have a quick look at that. Clear. 1, N, A, and 5. What's going to happen if we try to order that? Um, so we're going to order by X. It's going to do it numerically, putting N, A's at the end. So 1, 5, increasing order, N, A put at the end. If we try and do decreasing order for X, we go numerically descending, 5, 1, and still the N, A's put at the end. So the general rule is N, A's always go to the end. You might want to have a think about how we could put N, A's um, at the start. That's one of the homework questions. but you remember the fact that um, all that's happening with these kind of arranging filters is that they're actually behaving on... Um, actually, no, I, I, I'll leave it for, for the homework for you to have a look at. Okay, so let's have a look at select. So that was um, filtering and arranging. Um, so selecting is a way we can uh, narrow down the number of columns in our data set. It could easily be the case with some real-world data that we have hundreds or maybe even thousands of columns. How can we narrow those down into just a few variables of interest? We do that using select. So very similar structure to the last few. And um, we use the select verb or command function with the data set. Um, I'm using here the iris data set. So um, something like this. Um, so measurements of three different types of flowers, of um, three different species, sorry, yeah, three different species of flowers. Um, and their sepal lengths, widths, and petal lengths and widths. And so we can, um, for example, just have the columns on petal length and petal width and the species by using select and just putting in those three columns there. And so we're going to lose sepal length and sepal width column. You see new data set we get returned here is, um, has just got those three in. Okay, so that's all well and good when we want to just select a few. But what if we um, want to select, um, let's say we have a thousand columns, we want to just remove a single one of those. It would be a pain to have to write out all 999 of the ones we want to keep. Instead, we can use the, um, the minus symbol, um, which is used for um, removing a certain column. If we do select iris and then minus species, we're going to remove um, the species column, leaving goes with all of the, the other ones um, that weren't specified to be removed here. You can also select a range of columns using uh, the colon operator. 
Um, and so this um, allows us to go from one column to another inclusively. So including the first and um, last one we mentioned. So this uses the order that the columns appear in the original data set. So here we have um, people length, width, petal length, width. And so um, we ask here to select the columns from iris from steeple length to petal length. The colon here means two. So include this first one, include the second, and anything in between. Here we have steeple length, steeple width was in between, and petal length gets returned to. And so we can also use this with the minus. So put this in brackets, make it clear, then use a minus. That's going to re remove all the ones from, ste from steeple length to petal length and anything in between. Okay, there's some useful functions we can use for kind of helping us to select things. Um, so we have a start with, then some um, kind of text in quotes. We're going to select all columns that begin with a certain thing. So um, maybe we could use, I don't know, uh, steeple. Select all columns begin with steeple. Um, ends with, um, going to be an end with something, contains it's anywhere inside. And there's, there's a few others here. I'm not going to get into them now. There's some exercises in the homework to practice a bit. I'll give a few examples in the live session. But um, if you want to learn more about these, you can use question mark select underscore helpers or question mark select. The documentation is split um, between the two of those. Have a read up on those if you want to learn more. Okay, so select can also be used for renaming columns. Um, this is easy to do using um, a function called rename. So Syntax for this is um, very similar to before. So rename, and then the data set is the first argument. And then we use these named arguments where um, the name is the, uh, the new name, and the actual value we pass in is the current column. Here we're saying take steeple length and um, turn that, uh, change it so its name is now length of steeple. The same with steeple length becoming width of steeple. Separate each of these by a comma. So here we have um, a new column, sorry, not a new column, same column as before, renamed to length of sepal and width of sepal. The other ones stay the same. That's how we can rename things. Okay, so that's selecting. The next thing to look at is how we can um, add new variables to our data set. And we can do this using the mutate function, mutate verb. It allows us to transform a single variable or multiple variables that are currently in our data set into a new one. So the new column can be added at the end of the data set, or if a column with that name already exists, it um, overwrites the existing one. So as well as creating new ones, you can use this for replacing the value of a current one, maybe um, converting a um, column in grams into kilograms. Let's look at this, um, this data set here. It's just, just some, some data set, um, some data on the temperatures on, on different days. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then temperature in degrees Celsius. I can mutate this um, by taking the data set as the first argument, always that same pattern. And then um, I'm then going to pass in um, a named argument. The name is going to be um, the name of the new column. And I'm going to set that equal to some function of existing columns. So I'm going to take temperature underscore C times by 1.8 and add 32. Um, I can't remember the conversion. There we go. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so that's going to take temperature in degrees Celsius convert it to Fahrenheit, and then that's going to be assigned to a new column called temp underscore F for Fahrenheit. So run this and we get a new column here that has the values in Fahrenheit. So just as we see here. Okay, and so we're also able to um, create a new column based on multiple values um, or multiple variables that exist already. For example, we have um, a data set called health. And this has um, names, their weights, and their heights. We might want to calculate their BMI. And we could do this by um, taking their weight divided by height squared and send that equal to the BMI. So same as before, but now we use two variables um, to create this new one. So nothing wrong with doing that. Okay. And we're also able to um, create multiple variables in one go referencing variables we just created in creating new ones. So here we have a um, data frame called Sprint, which has um, data on um, using bolts 
record breaking um, sprint time. So at what time? So one, three, and five seconds. Um, how far have you traveled in meters? So eight, 26, and 47. So I'm going to take this day set sprint and mutate it to add two new columns. So I put a new line here, doesn't matter. R doesn't really care about new lines or sort of spaces. The first new column I make is average speed meters per second. And if you know your um, GCC physics, this is going to be um, distance over time. So take uh, the distance in meters, divide it by the time in seconds. And that gives this new column here, giving the average speed so far in meters per second. I then want to convert that into kilometers per hour. And I can do that um, in the same mutate function. So I take average speed meters per second, which was only just created, and times that by 3.6. That gives me average speed kilometers per hour, the new column here. It's important that these happen in this order. You couldn't put this one uh, before. It has to come after because it's dependent uh, on this. You are free to chain these things together to get these more complicated mutates. Okay, so I'm just going to run through some kind of useful functions for um, mutating. So we have the basic arithmetic operators, so plus, minus, times, divide, and um, carrot symbol for um, exponentiation powers. Um, there's some useful aggregate functions we might, might care about as well. So, um, yeah, let's have a look at an example of this. Um, let's, for example, um, have a data set here, and we're going to call it um, sales. It's going to contain the name of three people. See, I'm very uncreative in my naming. It's always Anne, Bob, and Cat. And um, they sold... Um, how many items they sold? Four, six, and five. Okay, so that's our data set there. And what I might want, want to do is um, mutate sales. So I, I'm going to create a new variable called sold prop for the proportion of sales. That's going to be sold divided by um, the sum of sold. Basically, how many were sold divided by the total number that was sold. So the sum has them all up here. And so we're now going to get these proportions doing something like, like that. We could do a similar thing by um, tracking away the mean of the column to kind of center them all around the average sales. So we can see here that Pat was completely average, Bob was above average, and Anne was below average. And so that's two examples there. You can see that we combine together individual um, kind of row-wise operations. This sum acts over the whole column. Um, so really something quite complicated happened there, but it, you know, it's expressed in a very simple and elegant way. And uh, yeah, that, that second thing I did there is known as, um, as centering the data. Here's the two other useful things, is um, these two operators. So percentage slash percentage and dual percentage. And these combined are known as modular arithmetic. And it's um, maths talking about um, remainders. So let's start with the um, percentage percentage. This asks what is the remainder when I divide the number on the left by the number on the right. So if I divide 15 by 4, what's the remainder? Well, 4 goes in, into 12 three times, and then there's 3 left over. So the remainder is 3. 14, uh, the symbol's called modulo, modulo 4, is 2, because there's 2 left over. Um, and so that's used for calculating remainders. Um, on the other hand, we have this um, percentage slash percentage, known as integer division. It's going to calculate um, the biggest multiple of the right-hand side that goes into the left without going over. So here I have um, 4 can go into 14 three times. Uh, if I tried to put a fourth in, I'd have 16 and I'd gone over. So you can think of this as dividing this by the right and then rounding down. Biggest amount of the right I can go in, in, in into the left. So these are really useful when you're considering things that have um, cyclic behavior, say um, uh, days of the week or um, anything to do with, um, with, with time, I guess. So here we have a data set uh, called times. It has um, these times in, uh, in military time. Um, and we want to separate those into hours and minutes. We do that by um, taking the time. Hours going to be, well, how many hundreds can I get in? If it's um, 0923 basically means 923 as a number. 
the hour is um, how many hundreds I can get into that. I can get nine of those hours in. If I want to go one more, I'd be 10 something I gone over. So um, we can take the inch division to get the hour and the minute we can do the remainder when divided by 100. So how much more than a multiple of 100 is this number? That's going to be how many minutes there are. You can see something like that here. Also have logarithms. So uh, we can use uh, log for natural logarithms, log two for base two or log 10 for base 10. Okay, and so there's also some um, more useful functions. Uh, so we have um, these cumulative functions. These um, uh, take a column and uh, I guess let, let's just give an example of them in, in play. Let's take this, uh, this table here. So it looks something uh, like this. So one, four, and zero. We're gonna take that. And we're going to um, have a few cumulative functions on it. So I'm going to create a new column called sum, the cumulative sum, card cumulative product, and then min, max, and mean. And so I guess what a cumulative function does, it calculates a certain statistic as you work through the data. So the cumulative sum calculates the sum so far through the data. So we start with um, first number one, sum is one. Then have one and four, the cumulative sum is five. Then have one, four, zero, cumulative sum is still five. Same with product, we start with one, one times four is four, one times four times zero is zero. And we can see the same for min, max, and mean here. You, you can use these for kind of keeping track of the statistic um, throughout uh, a data set as you kind of work through it. We can also use logical comparisons. So for example, here we have uh, two times, create a new column afternoon, which is going to be whether time is bigger than or equal to one um, one thousand two hundred the lunch time, uh, and if so, it's then the afternoon. You see, we get false here and true here. So we get logical values as our columns. The logical column signified by this um, L G L here. Okay. The last thing we're going to look at is um, the summary function for summarizing um, our variables. Okay, so. Summarize, or you can also use the US spelling with a Z, allows you to collapse a data frame down into a single row using an aggregation function, um, or also known as a statistic. For example, we can have a data set uh, like this. So this is the profits. And it's um, about profits we made on each day of the week. And so let, let, let's summarize this data. And uh, we're going to take profits, always the data set first and ask what is um, average profit made over the days. Average profit, and that's going to be the mean of the profit. So a new column is going to be the mean of um, what profit we, we made on each day. I run this and I get NA, because we had NA values in our data. If we want to compute this, we're going to have to use NA.remove rules equals true. We run this and we get the average profit here. So it claps down. All those values into a single value, uh, 412. Just as we see here. So you might be wondering what's the point of that? Um, we could have done this another way. So we could have taken the profits data set, um, taken the profit column using a dollar sign here, and then put that inside of the mean function. So na.remove equals true. I'll get the same answer, 412. I bother with this. It's a lot longer, in fact, than the um than, than this thing thing here. And rather than getting just, just a number, we get this kind of um silly one by one data set. It, it seems strange. And so the reason is that summarize kind of becomes a lot, lot more powerful when we when we combine it with this thing called group by. So I briefly mentioned um group by before. It's used for changing the scope at which we aggregate data. So Let's take this new modified version of profits, something like, like this. And now we have not just the day of the week, but whether or not it is a weekday. True and then false for the last two. We want, we want to ask, do we make, make more on weekdays or on weekends? So to do this, we can group this profits data set um, by the weekday. Use this group by function. As always, the data set is the first argument. And then we say what column um, or multiple columns we want to group by. And here we want to group by the weekday column. 
Drupal day set by the weekday. We do this and then this creates a grouped data set that we're going to call by weekday. We use that um, assignment there to take this group data frame and assign it to by weekday. By weekday looks something like this. You see here groups of this data set which weren't displayed before um, are the weekday. And there's two different groups, uh, either weekday or not weekday. Okay, and then we can summarize this grouped version using the exact same command we used before. Like I'll even I'll press up to go back to the same command we had before. But now, sorry, I'm going to have to change the name of the, the data set. We're now going to look at the um, group da data set. Now, when we, we run this, you get two summaries. One for um, where, when it isn't a weekday and one for when it is a weekday. You can see here that when it's not a weekday, we make more profit on average. And you can see a warning here. This was added in um, a very recent version of dplyr. Um, and so if you want to get rid of, of this, this warning, um, you have to add um, dot groups equals um, drop end. And this is just, just, just a warning to say that um, uh, the groups will, will, will disappear uh, once we do a summarize. If you want to learn more about, about this, Look at the help page for summarize and um, have a look at the dot groups. You can see this is currently experimental. I think it's unnecessary. I think it causes more confusion than it's worth, but um, the DeepFly team are trying it out, so they're going with it. Okay. You can also summarize by um, multiple different variables. So, um, oh, no, 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 sorry. Yeah, so yeah, we can group by multiple variables. We just put a comma here, then another. This is an example of summarizing multiple variables at the same time. So creating multiple summaries in one go. And so uh, we can do um, a similar grouping. So we're going to take the iris data set and group by um, the species. So there could be three different species there. That's going to give us the data set um, by species. We can then summarize this. And we're going to create um, this in the console so we can see it a bit clearer. So by species is something like this. So grouped data set, um, three delta species. Um, those species are, let's see, 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 see what they are. We'll um, look at the species here. Yeah, so Satosa, uh, Versicolor, and uh, Virginia. Okay, so then we're gonna run this command here. Just pop this across and we'll break it down. So we're gonna take by species. Uh, the first thing we're going to do, let's put on a new line, is uh, calculate the mean of the sepal length. I know there's no missing values here, so we don't need to have na dot remove if we use true. And that's going to be called uh, mean underscore sepal length. We use the special function um, n, which counts how many um, observations are in each group, count how many, um, yeah, how many observations there are. And then we're going to calculate the range of each um, petal width, taking petal width, calculate the range, then using diff turn that into an actual difference of ranges, which is the scientific range. To run that, you can see now we have um, the grouping column and three summary columns like that. Okay, um, and so here's an example of grouping by multiple variables. So um, here we have a data set air quality. It has air quality data for, I think, New York. Uh, we see something like this. So it has um, ozone, solar radiation, wind, temperature on each month and each day. And so what we might want to do is group by both the month and the half of the month, whether it's the start or the end. And so we start by creating a, um, a new column. Uh, so we take air quality and we create a new column called mun underscore half. I'm going to use some notation here that we haven't seen before. It'll be fairly explanatory. So if else, so if. Day is less than or equal to 15. We were at the start of the month. Um, it should have the value start, otherwise end. And so if we see this, um, what we end up with is um, a set like this. We have a new column, one half, which is either start or end, depending on where we are through the month. That's a new column that we created. And then we're going to take this and we're going to group it by both the month and the half of the month. So use group by here get us air quality underscore group. Okay, so group that by those two columns. I will now see that we have air quality grouped. 
two grouping variables month and month half, giving us 10 different groups. Five months, each of them with a start and end. And then we can do a summary. So say, um, what's the median wind? The median of the wind column. And we're going to get one value for every um, every group. So for um, each combination of month and the half of the month. So see here that the ordering got a bit, 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 a, bit a bit messed up. It ends up with um, end coming first um, before start. That's because it went alphabetical and you could use a range to um, reorder those. So that's grouping by multiple variables. But you can see here that this is getting quite, quite messy. We have these two temporary variables here that we, um, we use once and then completely throw away. Um, it, and it's just quite hard to follow what's going on here. There, there's a, a more elegant notation for that. And so dplyr comes with this, this tool called the pipe. Um, and it is um, this symbol here, percentage, right arrow percentage. Um, and it's used for creating these things called pipelines. Allow you to take data and flow them through multiple functions. Um, and so we can use this to rewrite the, um, the command we had before. So actually first, a brief introduction to pipe operator. What it does, it takes the output of the previous command or previous function, and then puts that as the first argument in the next function. And this is why it's so important that all these dplyr verbs all take um, a data frame as their first argument and output a new data frame as, um, as the output. It works really well with the pipe. You take the output and pipe that into the first argument of the next function. Using this, we can take the code on this slide and rewrite it like, like this. Take air quality and pipe it into the first argument here. Almost as if we wrote air quality at the start here. Instead, it's implied by this, this pipe. Then take the output of that, pipe it, so whatever this gives us, pipe that into the first argument of group by. Whereas as before, we had this temporary variable month split, and we had to put that as the first argument of group by. Now we don't have to specify anything. Pipe will automatically add a first argument containing the data set we're working on. And same with summarize here. So no temporary variables, and we never have to specify these first arguments um, apart from putting in the data set at the start here. It's a really elegant way of working. Um, and so this, this piping operator is taken actually from a package called um, Mobrita, uh, which has a lot more kind of functionality than just um, this single pipe. Actually, this pipe itself can do a lot more than um, it's often used in dplyr. And if you want to know more about that, I'm going to link um, a blog post that I wrote kind of briefly summarizing all the stuff um, Magrita and the pipe operator can do um, in the comments or in chat of the live session. And so with that, here's a final example um, that we're going to look at. You can ask the question, it's a bit of a, a silly question, um, of all large diamonds, um, what is the median volume? And we're going to assume that the volumes are approximately an ellipsoid, so like um, a 3D oval, um, for each foot. It's a very yeah, pointless question, but it's, it kind of demonstrates all the different ideas we can combine together. So we're actually going to break this down from the start. So I'm going to create a script to do this so we can see it as it builds up. So question. Of all diamonds of color G, so I said all large diamonds here, but I don't think I actually ever filtered by that. So we're going to ignore that. We're going to assume of all diamonds of color G. First thing I'm going to do, filter so that the color is G. So take diamonds, pipe that into the filter function. I don't have to specify anything like diamonds again because we piped it in. I want the color to be the color G. So let's run this and we get, um, oh, you want to know how I run that? Um, control shift enter thing. So there we go. Um, now we can see that the color is G for all those. Great. What is the median volume for each? So the first thing we're going to need is the volume. And I've just taken a formula off Wikipedia. You would not be expected to know this. Um, I didn't for sure. The volume of um, an ellipsoid, approximately four thirds uh, times pi of its x, y, and z lengths, which we have here. So we run this. And now we have a new column. Volume is the volumes based on that formula. So we then want to calculate the median volume, but so 
We're going to group by uh, the cut. And then once we've done that, we can then summarize to calculate the median volume. And um, that's going to be the median of the volume. So run that. And after each cut, we have the median volume. And then we're going to wrap this up with some ggplot code. We're not going to get too into this because we haven't actually seen this yet. We'll come back to this in the last session. We'll learn about some more geometries. Um, now we take this and we output this into ggplot. Normally we put the data set here, but the pipe does that for us. There we just specify the aesthetics. So x is the cut, the y is the median volume, and the fill, which is a property for gmcol, is going to be the cut. And then we use gmcol, which is used for column plots. So we run this and we get something like that. So really, if we ignore the comment here, um, seven lines of code. And you could basically read this out. So take diamonds, filter to the colors G, create the volume column with this formula, group by the cut, summarize for the medium volume, and plot with these aesthetics. And you could probably pass this to someone that's never seen R, you can have a good guess of what's going to happen. So hopefully this is an example to sort of kind of bring together the ideas of why we're bothering with it with the tidyverse. That it might seem strange to learn at the start, once you get into the habit of it, it's a really elegant and consistent system and can let you make these very beautiful plots very easily. With that, um, thank you all for listening to the session. I look forward to seeing you next week to learn about this thing called tidy data.